Welcome to Potts Grove Manor, the 18th century home of John Potts, his family, and the servants and enslaved persons who worked here. The Potts family were involved with the iron industry, as well as the founders of current day Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Today, the museum is owned and operated by the County of Montgomery as part of their division of parks, trails, and historic sites. John and Ruth Potts had 13 children, many of whom followed into the iron industry itself. But one son, Jonathan, decided to take a different path and pursue a career in medicine. There isn't a lot of information about Jonathan's childhood. He was born in 1745 and was about eight years old when the family had this house built and moved here. He likely went to a boarding school and received an excellent education. But unfortunately, there are no documents that survive about his early life. He begins apprenticing under Philadelphia doctor Phineas Bond before becoming a student apprentice at the Pennsylvania Hospital. In 1766, Jonathan is given the opportunity that the Potts family wealth and social standing afforded him. The ability to study at the University of Edinburgh, the leading English speaking medical school in the world during his time. At the age of 22, Jonathan traveled with another soon to be Dr. Benjamin Rush to Edinburgh, where they both hoped to earn their MD at the university. Once they were there, Jonathan wrote to his family and frequently asked about his new fiance, Grace Richardson. However, he also wrote to good family friend, Benjamin Franklin, and Franklin obliged, writing letters of introduction to the provost of the university, but he also wrote to the young gentlemen, offering them some advice. Um, with this, I send your letters for several of my friends in Edinburgh. It will be a pleasure to me if they prove of use to you. But you will be your own best friend if you apply diligently to your studies, refraining from all idle, useless amusements that are apt to lessen or withdraw the attention from your main business. This from the characters you bear in the letters you brought. I am persuaded you will do. Letters of recommendation may serve a stranger for a day or two, but where he is to reside for years, he must depend on his own conduct, which will either increase or totally destroy the effect of such letters. I take the freedom, therefore, of counseling you to be very circumspect and regular in your behavior at Edinburgh where the people are very shrewd and observing that so you may bring from thence a, as good a character as you carry thither and in that respect not be inferior to any American that has ever been there before you. You have great advantages in going to study at Edinburgh at this time where there happens to be collected a set of as truly great men philosophers of the several branches of knowledge as have ever appeared in any age or any country. I recommend one thing particularly to you, that besides the study of medicine, you endeavor to obtain a thorough knowledge of natural philosophy in general. You will from thence draw great aids in judging well both diseases and remedies and avoid many errors. I mention this because I have observed that a number of physicians here and as well as in America are miserably deficient in it. I wish you all the happiness and success of your undertakings and remain your friend and humble servant, Benjamin Franklin. However, Almost as soon as Jonathan arrives, he receives news that his fiancée, Grace, is sick and he has to hurry home to be with her. He travels down to London trying to book passage, but is delayed due to poor weather and is unable to return home until April of 1767. When he does arrive home, he's able to meet his newly born daughter. 
You can't help but wonder though, as Jonathan comes home without a medical degree and to a small premarital family, if the words of Dr. Franklin were ringing in his ears. Nevertheless, the Potts' wealth and status meant that Jonathan was able to continue his education and he attended the newly opened medical school at the College of Philadelphia. In 1768, Jonathan received his bachelor's degree from the College of Philadelphia. This degree is written in Latin, and Jonathan was one of the first 10 men to graduate from this college, and he delivered the valedictorian speech. This was a triumphant and emotional time for Jonathan. In May of that year, he and his wife had their second child, a son named Benjamin Rush Potts, after his Edinburgh compatriot. But it was also a very sad time because his father had passed away two weeks prior to his graduation due to an unknown illness. But John Potts Sr. made sure his family was left well off. But Jonathan and his older brother John Jr. did not receive as much of an inheritance as their other brothers because of the considerable expense of their education. But Jonathan's education was not over yet. He returned to the College of Philadelphia shortly after his graduation to do his studies to earn his MD. In 1771, he wrote a thesis on malaria. By doing this, he had finally earned the title of Dr. Jonathan Potts. Then decided to pack up his family and his, along with his three living children and moved them to the city of Reading where he opened his apothecary and practice. Reading was a growing city in need of professionals like Dr. Potts. Jonathan had plenty of relatives in the surrounding area and the city offered many opportunities for his young family. Here he was also able to remain up to date with his field and be a young physician in a growing city. Jonathan's letter book for his office tells a story of a growing practice with frequent orders and a need for the latest knowledge and tools of 18th century medicine. He continued to make a name for himself beyond that as a trained physician and eventually entered politics. As a representative for Berks County, Jonathan served on several committees and the Rumbles of Revolution in Boston soon began testing Pennsylvanians. Potts made his position clear and supported boycotts and resistance and British tyranny. He published a plea to shopkeepers and farmers in Berks County to support the stockpiling and boycotting measures taken by the assembly. The committee of the County of Berks take the liberty earnestly to recommend to the inhabitants of this county not to sell any sheep whatsoever to any butcher from Philadelphia or elsewhere till the first day of May. The preserving of wool being an object of the greatest consequence the committee will meet in Reading on Tuesday, the 14th day of February next, if any inhabitants have any objection to make to the measure recommended. The revolution was here and Jonathan served the American cause. His skills as a doctor meant that he was sent where they were needed most, which was the Northern Medical Department. It must have been a huge transition and shock to go from the countryside of Pennsylvania as a city doctor to the military hospitals at Lake George area of New York. The Northern Department of the Army in July of 1776 is coming off of a failed invasion of Canada where disease, especially smallpox, brought their army to the brink of collapse. When Jonathan arrives in July of 1776 to Fort Ticonderoga, he writes about the shocking number of the sick and how there is no hospital or really any supplies to treat them. The dressing situation of the sick here is not to be described. Without clothing, without bedding, or shelter sufficient to keep them from the weather, we have present upwards of a thousand sick, and crowded into shed and laboring under the various and cruel disorders of dysenteries, bilious putrid fevers, and the effects of confluent smallpox. Jonathan was far from a typical soldier during the American Revolution. He was sent to Fort Ticonderoga, and we have his wonderful commission here that is signed by one of the most famous signatures in American history, John Hancock. This is stating that Jonathan was 
the Deputy Director General of the Hospitals of the Northern Department. The 1776 defense of the Champlain Valley is certainly one of the most underappreciated but significant military campaigns of the Revolutionary War. And a large part of that was due to the management of medical issues uh, by the Continental Army, and particularly by Jonathan Potts. Now, the American army that retreated from Canada in the spring and early summer of 1776 was a devastated, demoralized force. Uh, an army that had suffered at the hands of the British, but was also riven with disease, particularly smallpox, uh, but also dysenteries and fevers of various kinds. It was a very unhealthy army. And when General Horatio Gates took command of that army, it was decided they would ultimately make their stand at Ticonderoga, precisely because Ticonderoga had not had serious outbreaks of illness the way the Canadian army had experienced or other American posts further to the south had. But Part of the plan was not just to re-establish an American military presence on Lake Champlain that could stop the British, it was also to manage the spread of illness to make sure that the thousands of men in the Northern Department would be ready to face their adversaries when they approached. And this was the work of Dr. Jonathan Potts, who was assigned to a newly established hospital at Fort George at the southern end of Lake George, roughly 30 miles uh, southwest of Ticonderoga on the site of a former British military posts from prior to the war. Here, Dr. Potts would oversee the maintenance of the health and the care of soldiers, particularly suffering from smallpox. And the establishment of this hospital was precisely to get those men away from the main army, uh, to, to physically isolate them from the rest of the army, to manage the disease, and to prevent its further spread, which would have been devastating to the army at large. Even as it was, illness was a bigger threat to the Continental Army, um, as acknowledged by many American officials than the British, uh, their Native American allies, or any other factor. So managing the health of the army was vital to this process, and Potts's management of the hospital at Fort George was a monumental task, because almost overnight, you went from creating what was a small ancillary military post to a hospital containing two to 3,000 men at any given point in time. And he was consistently undersupplied with medicines, with equipment, uh, with properly trained surgeons and doctors, um, and also just nurses to manage the site. We know that women attached to the Continental Army at Ticonderoga were detached and sent to Fort George to act as nurses to aid uh, with the recovery of troops from Fort George. And in the face of all of these obstacles, remarkable obstacles, keeping uh, men who had smallpox and who did not have smallpox separated from each other, nursing men back to health, the army accomplished something remarkable, a recovery. And within a couple of months, Potts had overseen uh, the, the revival of the Continental Army in the Northern Department. Now, this was combined with an enormous amount of work that was going on at Ticonderoga that needed manpower to dig redoubts, earthworks, to emplace artillery, to drill, to train, uh, and to equip themselves to be able to face the British they knew uh, would be arriving later that year. Ultimately, the British did pursue the Americans, and they engaged Benedict Arnold's fleet at the Battle of Valcour Island on October 11th of 1776, and then pushed further south, driving the Americans from their advanced posts at Crown Point and threatening Ticonderoga itself. Now, to prepare for what was anticipated to be the advance of this British army, uh, General Gates actually recalled Dr. Potts to Ticonderoga, assuming that there would be a, a large number of casualties that would have to be dealt with in the ensuing engagement. Uh, Potts came back to Ticonderoga, and in fact, his medical success had been so profound that soldiers from Pennsylvania regiments recovering at Fort George accompanied him and rejoined their comrades at Ticonderoga to prepare uh, for the coming British invasion. Now, as it happened, the British approached the American outworks and found not that demoralized, diseased, defeated army that they had driven out of Canada so handily, but rather an American force that was prepared to meet them, that was well-equipped, well-armed, for the first time, although there was still a large number of sick men within the army, a healthy force that was prepared to meet the British on their own terms. And this, with the delaying action of the Battle of Valcour Island and the rapidly advancing winter, encouraged General Carleton to pull his troops back. And 
the victory in 1776, a victory largely without a battle, provided vital support for the American cause. In fact, British officials felt that the failure of Carleton to successfully accomplish the reduction of Ticonderoga was really the last chance the British had to win the American Revolution. And that victory, that victory without a staggering cost in life, was due in large part to the efforts of the officers of the Northern Army, and in particular, Dr. Jonathan Potts, for his role in husbanding the health and well-being of those soldiers against all odds in the remarkable campaign of that year. Jonathan was not close to home, but he did have massive responsibilities. He needed to care for the soldiers, and he was trying to get medicine and supplies for these men. He kept writing letters to Dr. John Morgan asking for supplies. Dr. Morgan was one of the teachers that he studied under at the College of Philadelphia, so there was already a relationship established there. Jonathan must have been moved by his work while he was there at Fort Ticonderoga. Found among his papers was this hand-drawn map that we believe that Jonathan drew of Fort Ticonderoga. The map highlights the fortifications where certain troops have their lines and the general layout of the fort. One interesting part of the map is that Fort Independence is marked out at the top here, which was built while Jonathan was there as extra protection. While the pencil drawings are faint and hard to see today, the map still illustrates what stood out and what was meaningful for Jonathan to point out and remember. It was during 1777 that Jonathan was finally able to get the disease under control at Fort Ticonderoga, and his efforts did not go unnoticed. He was praised in Congress by General Horatio Gates for his leadership and valiant efforts. We we're able to see that Jonathan is securing much needed medicines and linens for the hospitals of the Army of the Northern Department. For his efforts in 1776 and 1777, he'll eventually be promoted to Brevier General and Deputy Director of the Hospitals of the Middle Department to include the Valley Forge encampment in the winter of 1777 and 1778. But unfortunately, something causes Jonathan to retire from military service, and he will end up returning back to his childhood home at Potts Grove. The medical department had constant infighting and struggle, and this caused Congress to become suspicious of almost every officer, and this included Jonathan. He found himself the subject of rumors that he had made a fortune while the purveyor and he had exploited his position. However, none of these rumors were true and his compatriots quickly came to his defense, but it seems the damage was done. Poor health and citing the inability to support his family on army pay led Jonathan to resign in the spring of 1780. However, this must have come with some mixed feelings as he did write um, a bill for Congress for 173,000 pounds for back pay, interest, and reimbursement of personal expenses during his service. We don't know why Jonathan wrote this bill, whether it was truly that he needed to support his family and wanted to be reimbursed, or if there were some more complicated feelings. However, his failing health caused him to write up his last will and testament on October of 1780. He, the last 12 months of his life were a little unknown. There's only one patient recorded in his ledger. And on October 15th, 1781, Jonathan does pass away from an unknown disease. He leaves behind his wife, Grace, and five living children. Jonathan's life is a story of struggle, success, and patriotism, but it was cut short and could have been so much more. We still learn from Jonathan's story today, whether about the soldiers at military hospitals, about what wealth and status can mean to someone's life and the mistakes, as well as what hard work and determination can achieve, but also at what cost. 
to me, Jonathan was an advocate. Father. Resourceful. A leader. A son. Resilient. A patriot. Strong. Hot. An idealist. And a rebel. 